Hi, Vine Church. Uh, my name is Zane. For those of you who don't know, I get to preach for us this morning. I'll be in Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. We're going to take a quick break out of the Genesis series, uh, simply because I had the opportunity to preach for another church in Seattle called New Light Church down in Seattle. And, uh, and that's the passage that he assigned me for, for his congregation. And since I had already went through the, the effort and study of, of preparing a sermon, uh, we thought it would be good for Brandon to be able to get a break and for me to be able to address you all. Uh, the passage also seemed uh, very timely for, for our day and for the life of our church and the life of uh, God's people and our nation. And so I, I hope that it's beneficial to us all uh, for our church. And uh, I'm thankful to get the opportunity to, to preach it for us. And so in Romans 12, 9 through 21, essentially we just have, it's just a list of commands. And there are lots of ways that people break this up. As many commentators as I, as I looked at their outlines, they broke this passage up in, in that many ways. And uh, so when I was looking at it, just, uh, just as a way of being honest, I in breaking it down in a way that makes most sense to me, but there's other ways, lots of other ways that people have break, broken these passages down. Some even said that it's just a random list that Paul, that Paul tend to just threw out there kind of as he was coming up with them. He was writing down this list of commands. I, I seem to think Paul is, tends to be more systematic than that in all his writings. And, um, and this is the way I'm going to preach it and present it is the way that makes most sense to me. But uh, just, to, just to be up, up front, we are going to dissect this, this list of commands um, and, and see what God has, has for us in it. And when I break this down, I see the, the first line in verse 9 as essentially the overarching goal of the list of commands. And, and that is let love be genuine. So we have an overarching goal of letting love be genuine. And then we have a whole bunch of commands that are essentially in pursuit of letting our love becoming genuine. The pursuit of genuine love, here's our action plan. And so any action plan that, that anyone has, uh, it's best to have, or any goal that anyone has, it's best to have a plan of action. If you have a goal and you don't have a plan of action, you're not likely to hit that goal. Just think of physical health. Uh, as an example, if you desire to be physically healthy, it's really wise to put together an action plan. Uh, how are you going to work out? How are you going to eat new, more nutritious? What are you going to do to hold yourself accountable? What sorts of steps are you going to take in the pursuit of your goal? And that's true for any goal that, that we take in order to be successful in it. We have to have a plan of action. And that's essentially my outline, my understanding of what Paul's doing here in, these, in this list of commands is... He's taking this goal of letting your love be genuine, and he's, he's, then we have a, a, an action plan. How do we work towards letting our love be genuine? Um, so I'm going to pray for us, and then, and then we'll get into a little background of Romans and then into, into the verses themselves. Father, uh, I thank you that, um, that we can come to your word and entrust that your Holy Spirit will move and work in your word. I pray that even as I'm uh, preaching to a camera, your Holy Spirit would be present and near to me and in, in influencing the words and the tone that, that I am preaching. Uh, Lord, I pray that, that I would honor you in this sermon. I pray that in a couple days from now, uh, as as our church listens to this message, that the Holy Spirit would be present in and act in and through the hearing of, of the word proclaimed, and, um, and that we would all seek to uh, apply. We would seek to worship you through the application of, of these passages, that, that you would let us be a genuinely loving people as individuals and as a church. Lord, let us be marked by your love. Because you first loved us, let us be marked by love. Um, Lord, we just thank you for, uh, even in this tough season as a church, that you've, you've drawn us together in many ways. You've, had, uh, you've brought good conversations, deep, tough conversations. You've brought um, people together and, um, 
in the ways that they are meeting and desiring to not neglect meeting. And Lord, there's so many ways that even in this season, our church is, is growing and maturing. And Lord, we thank you for that. And I pray you would continue to do that and allow us to honor you with our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Romans 12, and it's a li- list of commands. But in any command, any, any imperative, anything in life that it's imperative we must do something, uh, it's also really important to know the indicative. Why must we do something? And so in, in the book of Romans, chapters 1 through 11 is essentially Paul just laying this theological tome out for people. He's, he's telling the beauties of the gospel. He's, he's, and then he's applying it to the Roman church. The Roman church is a specific church in history that Paul is writing to, and they had specific issues. And one issue that, that they had, seemingly, uh, through the passages is they were struggling with racial tension in their church because we know this because Paul continually is, is saying that these, these theological truths that he's teaching, he keeps saying that they apply to Jews and to Greeks. And so we know that there's this tension because he's trying to flatten the, the playing field and say, and say that no, 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 we are all one in Christ. And, uh, And so I'm just going to give a super brief overview of the chapters 1 through 11, just so we can have a little bit of fuel to get us into the imperatives, that we have a little, a little understanding of what Paul, why are we doing this list of things? Because no one likes hearing a list of these are the things you must do. Uh, we get super defensive of it. But if you understand the truths of why, we're doing something, it actually can help us carry in and through uh, to fulfill these commands. And so just the most overview uh, I can possible, possibly do of, of chapters 1 through 11 is essentially Paul is, is trying to convict the reader, uh, the Roman church, and then to us, that, that we are all sinners and that, that everyone has fallen sh- short of the, the glory of God. Uh, and then he says, no distinction. Not, not Jew or Greek. There, there's no distinction. Everyone has fallen short. And then he also says that though we're all sinful, righteousness can be found through Jesus Christ and through faith in him. And then he says again, no distinction, not Jew or Greek. So we see the, the playing field being, being flattened. All are sinful. All find um, hope and, and righteousness through Jesus Christ. And then he actually goes on to say, instead of the distinction of pitting yourself as, as Jew or Greek, he's saying that the, the, the better distinction to make is in Adam or in Christ. All humanity falls into the, one of those two distinctions. Um, you are either in Adam, being that we are sinfully born into Adam. We are born into Adam and we are his descendants and we are born into sin and thus deserving of wrath and judgment, or we are in Christ. We are, we are reborn into Christ. And so the distinction of those in Adam are still in their sins. Those in Christ are, have, been made, have been made new. And then for those who are in Christ, uh, Romans 8 tells us the whole list of beautiful things of those who are in Christ. There's no condemnation for us. Uh, we are adopted into his family. We're heirs to his kingdom. Uh, that all things work for good for us, that we become more than conquerors, and that no matter what happens in this life, nothing can separate us from the love of God. For those who are in Christ, that is our beautiful truth. That's what's driving us towards this response, this, this worshipful response of these actions that we're doing, is understanding that we are not better than anyone else. We are just either in Adam or in Christ and being in Christ is a beautiful, wonderful thing that can propel us forward to respond and worship to him. Uh, but in, in chapters 9 through 11, he, he does go on and say that just because the, the playing field has been flattened, leveled, as far as salvation and how that works, that culturally, there's still distinctions. There's still wonderful cultural things between Jews and Greeks that, that are to be celebrated. The, the Jews have, 
have their traditions and they have the Torah and they have all that God's done through the Jewish people. And he didn't flatten and say, there's no more distinctions culturally. He's saying, that's actually yours and, and yours forever. And then the, the Gentiles, we actually have been grafted into God's family. And that, that's something that is distinct about Gentiles and we're to celebrate it. And so it's not saying that we need to look at people with sort of this, this culturally flattened understanding and just look at all people as the same. But it's a humility that we are all sinful and that we, all of us who are in Christ are, are debtors to the same Christ and we're recipients of the same grace. And so that we get to respond in, in worship. And then so we get to 12. And before we get into the, the verses uh, that we're specifically in, the action plan of 12, uh, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, therefore, since of all this beautiful theology, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present yourself, uh, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And so because of the truths that Paul has laid out, therefore, we get to worship God through our actions. We get to live as living sacrifices because Christ sacrificed himself on the cross for us because he brought us into his family, because we are the recipients of all those beautiful things in, in Romans chapter 8. Therefore, we get to be living sacrifices. And, um, and he says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Um, and, so, and so as we're living out as God's people, those in Christ, we are to not be transformed by the world. We are in the world, but we're to or we're not to be conformed by the world. And the world is constantly trying to conform us, but we're to be transformed by Christ and, um, and by his word. And that's how we know what is good. And then so we get into, into our passages today. And, and the, the overall goal of let love be genuine. So as we get into our passages, we're coming on the, the, on the wave of grace that God has given us. And so our response is this action plan. We desire, because of all that God has done for us, our worship of living sacrifices is to, is to be in pursuit of genuine love. That's me as myself. That's you as individuals. And us as a church and, and all the churches of God are desi- desire to pursue genuine love. And the translation of genuine can, is also many times translation, translated without hypocrisy. And so it's just the idea of not wearing a mask, that in our pursuit of genuine love, we want it to be real. We, we want it to actually change us, to have real love for people, real love for God, um, and, and not just uh, this fake love that might be put on. It's not a fake it till you, till you make it sort of thing. It's a genuine love for God. And so, um, and so I've summarized this action plan that, that Paul uh, gives us in the next verses as the passionate pursuit of God and his people. And so we'll continue and we'll see how, how that plays out. He says, Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. And so here we see that God's people need to passionately pursue pursue God and his people. It, and I think a lot of times we, we might think of it as a, well, I guess if we're not feeling passionate, we sort of got to fake it till you make it. But, but I don't think that's the case. We're all individuals. We're all incredibly diverse and different in what our passions look like. And even in, in uh, James, I think our passion is, is assumed. In James 4.1, it says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. So there's the assumption that we have passions in us. And so when I say we, to follow God, to make our love be genuine, is to have a passionate pursuit of God and his people. I don't think it means to conjure up some sort of passion that we don't have in us. But I think it's just taking the passions that are already in us in our unique build that God has made us and directing them and directing them towards God and people rather than towards self. Because when we direct them towards self, it causes wars and fights because we're wanting for ourselves. But when we direct that passion towards other, 
It's actually worship to God and it's unity between Christians. And when he says to abhor evil and hold fast to what is good, it just makes me wonder what, what the Christian church would w- look like if we together abhorred evil and held fast to what is good. We're also different. We all have different backgrounds. We all have um, so much that has made us different, whether that's how we grew up, whether that's who our teachers were, whether that's how God made us think, um, whether we, how, how we think through, through policies that should be played out in the world, whether that's how we think the church should be run. Um, we're all so different. But I think this would be such a unifying factor is if as Christians, we could all agree together to abhor what is evil and to hold fast to what is good. Sometimes we get in these sides, we get in these wars, and we cozy up to evil done by our side. And we, we ignore it and we skirt, we skirt the issue. Uh, and, but we champion the good that we do. But we never want to champion the good of another side. And so I just wonder if as Christians... Wherever God has us in this world, wherever God has placed us, if we were together being transformed by the scriptures and by God and not conformed by the world, and we together in our various places in this world were abhorring evil, genuinely hating it, even the ones that are closest to us, even the ones that that have to do with me and my church and my uh, my family and my in-group, and we, we abhorred it. And we held fast to what's good, even, even the good in another group. I think as Christians, we would then be a unified front for Jesus in our culture, in our land. And it would help us love one another more genuinely. And in doing so, I think that will bring out the brotherly affection that Paul calls us to have. This is like familial affection. It doesn't mean that we are all all the same. We know in our families, we have many people very different than us. Uh, But the familial affection is actually causes us to want to lift one another up, to outdo one another in showing honor. And so this passage as part of our worship is is be looking to ways to to be competitive in, in in, uh, in raising up uh, and building up those in our church, uh, those in churches that are different than us. Maybe they're theologically different, and it doesn't mean we can't have real differences, but, but to outdo one another in showing honor and to look for God's people and to be united in, in all that we can, we can uh, find in there. And he, so he continues. He says, Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. So I think when we realize all that God's done for us, all that that we see in Romans chapter 1 through 11, it'll stir up in in us this this zeal that we're fervent towards serving the Lord. And this is the passionate pursuit of God. We want to pursue God, and the best way to pursue God passionately is to to know what he's done for us and then desire to, to lovingly serve him. And the ways we do that is we rejoice in hope, we're patient in tribulation, and constant in prayer. Oftentimes, especially as a Christian, especially in our world right now, life feels bleak. Life feels tough. And, and the, the word hope almost assumes that, that things aren't going as, as we expect them to. In order to have hope, we have a confident expectation. It means that things aren't going the way we want to, but we have a hope that God will come through. And so in our pursuit of God, in our service of him, we need to, have, we need to rejoice in our hope. And actually, uh, Abraham, earlier in Romans, is the example of hope. It says that when, when he was considering becoming a father of all nations and his body was as good as dead, it didn't make sense log- logically, physically. There was no hope, but yet he hoped against hope. In spite of being no human hope, he had hope in God. And so we get to, as Christians, rejoice that we have hope. And this is a hope that's unique to Christians. We have a hope that God overcomes what what does not seem logical, that God's promises will come through, that, that God's love for us and God's pursuit of us is something that will, will carry us through despite all circumstances. 
And we're to be patient in that. In the tribulations, in the tough times, uh, we're to be patient in that and constant in prayer. So we're not just patient and kind of checking out. Uh, it's so easy for me, especially when I'm, when I'm feeling something uncomfortable, I'm the kind of person that likes to not dwell on it. I just, I can get si sidetracked with a million things. But here it's saying that in our hope, it's not a distracted hope. It's a patient and constant in prayer hope. It's a kind of hope that, that, that dives into the, the issues and the problems. And we get to be prayerful and patient and rejoice because we have hope. And then these last two action items that Paul gives, gives for us in the pursuit of, of genuine love. He says, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Um, I'm just so thankful that our church, in the midst of the tribulations that we're, we're currently in, uh, it's a hard time in the world right now. It's a hard time in our church right now. But I am encouraged to see these, these things happening. Um, the contributing to the needs of the saints. We have people taking care of, of church members, and we also have people taking care of those outside. So the, the seeking to contribute to the needs of saints and showing hospitality is that our love should be, should be for our in-group, it should be for Christians, the needs of the saints, but it should be hospitable to draw people in. And in this time, in a time of tribulations, a time where so many people are looking for hope, I'm thankful that as a church, I've, I've seen this growing, and I, I pray that we can continue to do that. We can be a people of faith. We can be a people uh, that desire to love and bless one another because we have hope that God will bring us through this. And we can invite others in because there are so many people needing hope. And we have the hope of the God who loves us and who is in control of all this. And he uses all this to, to, for our good. And he will draw people in. And I just pray that, that he would continue to do so in, in my life and in the life of our church and all God's people. And just as in any action plan you have for a goal, there's, uh, there's obstacles along the way. And here I think Paul is getting into a reaction plan. So any goal that we, we set forth, we set up an action plan, uh, but then th things can, can come up that we didn't expect. And it's, it's really wise to have a reaction plan. And an example of, of doing that poorly is a couple years ago, I was in the gym. Only one time in my life have I ever regularly been in the gym. I had an action plan. I knew when I was going and, and I was doing it and, and it was great. It felt good. But I didn't have a reaction plan. So I broke my ankle at, at actually at a, a Vine uh, event when I was brand new to the church, but I broke my ankle, but I didn't have a reaction plan. I, so I never got back into the gym. I never knew the the time to, to work myself back up to where I was. And so the stumbling block came in my way and I tripped and I fell off, fell off the wagon to never return again, still to this day, never to return again. But in the Christian life, in the pursuit of genuine love, Paul is, is we're so grateful he gives us an action plan. And then we need to be so grateful that he gives us a reaction plan because in that pursuit, there will be uh, stumbling blocks, things that that are tempted to knock us off the pursuit of genuine love. And, and when we do so, he says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. So our natural response would be to curse someone. When an obstacle comes in the way, we're trying to pursue love, someone curses us and we instantly get defensive and want to curse them back. But, but Paul's saying, no, no, no. The reaction plan here is to actually bless when we're going down our path and we see someone rejoicing or see someone weeping, we, we might tend to, to be jealous of the person rejoicing. We might tend to be uncomfortable around the person weeping and think it's very inconvenient to come along them. But in, in the pursuit of, of genuine love, when things come up that we might not be expecting, Paul's saying to rejoice with those who rejoice to weep with those who weep, to humble ourselves. And that's what's going to cause harmony. He says, live in harmony with one another. So our natural responses are often going to cause discord. It's going to cause strife. And Paul's reaction plan causes harmony with one another because we're, we're thinking of one another. And so we need to be intentional in our reaction. Not only do we need to be intentional with our reaction, 
we need to be humble in our reaction. And we'll see that in this next, next part. He says, do not be haughty, but associate, associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of, in the sight of all. So here we say that there needs to be, be a humility among God's people. And sometimes um, we're tempted to be haughty, to think that we know the answers, to think that when people do evil to us, that we want to do evil back. But, but a humility is required in the pursuit of genuine love for people. And one thing that's been really encouraging to, to me is, of course, in our world right now, in our city, there's tons of strife. And even within our church, there are tons of people with different views on, on how to respond to all this, on, on what is good and what is evil, and, and, and how do we respond, and how do we respond as a church. And one example of never being wise in your own sight that I thought was really beautiful is I heard that a lot of the, the older people in our church, they've been meeting on Zooms every Wednesday night. And one thing that they did is in this cultural climate, they actually took a time for everyone to be able to speak and to not respond and to not necessarily need to debate. But they, in the attempt to never being wise in their own eyes and to, to humble themselves, everyone had a chance to speak. And there are tons of, of different opinions in our church and there are tons of different opinions um, in God's church. And so to, as Christians, in our pursuit of love, it doesn't mean we don't have thoughts and passions, but to humble ourselves, to, to think highly enough of others to speak to them and to listen to them is, um, is what we need to do as Christians. And, and I was thankful to hear that example of, of the, the older group in our, in our church. And thank you all for doing so uh, and for leading an example. And he continues, he says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. With all, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if, re, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. So, even, even in, this, in this desiring, as far as it depends on us, to live peaceably with all. I just thought this was a good opportunity for me to even uh, share with all you as a church. I, I know that some of the elders lately, myself included, have said uh, some things that, that those in our church might, might take as, as a slippery to- slope towards, um, towards you know, godless things. Uh, but, but let me just tell you that when you hear one of the elders, and not all of us agree exactly on how to how to say things or how to word things we're not like we're not conspiring together at exactly how to present these things to you uh but when some of our elders say something like black lives matter it what it is is it's it's being as far as it depends on us to live peaceably with all it's the desire to 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 hold fast to what's good so the fact that in our culture for so long, black lives haven't mattered and that there's a lot of pain and hurt. It takes a humility to be able to say, yes, black lives matter. And it is important for for Christians to to acknowledge that fact. Now, in saying that, it doesn't mean that you're agreeing with everything that the organization is, is standing for. But in our attempt to live peaceably with all. We should find groups. We should find organizations. We should find people and stances and hold up the beautiful things that, that are true in God's work. And, and it doesn't mean that we're agreeing with everything, but we're in our attempt to live at peaceably with all is our attempt to be hospitable. It's our attempt to show care. It's our attempt to build bridges wherever we can. And please, I've had many good conversations over the last couple of weeks like reach out to your elders and just know like we are absolutely steadfast on the gospel. We are we are sold out for uh, for God's word being true and it being what uh, transforms us. And we're not trying to be we're we're fighting as much as we can to be conformed by our culture, but we're all in a culture and all of our cultures are trying to conform us. 
Uh, and so we're to hold, ste- hold steadfastly to God's word and we're to try to live peaceably at all and, and, uh, and hold fast to what's good as much as we can. And whether we do that perfectly or not uh, is, is something that we are always trying to assess and I'm always trying to assess. And so uh, being open for conversations and, and being, never being wise in our own sight and having these conversations has been, has been great. And I hope our church continues to do that. And it, it shows to me a maturity and a desire to be, uh, to be fruitful. Our church desires to be fruitful for God. And so having these conversations is a great and wonderful thing, and I would encourage it to keep up. Um, and then he says, in, in the continued response of reacting humbly, he says, never repay, never avenge evil, but leave that up to the Lord. Instead, do good. If someone's hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. When, if, and he says that by doing so, you heap coals on their head. And in the Old Testament, heaping coals on someone's head is, is a, a, a judgment. It's to have coals being heaped on someone's head is a sign of judgment. And, and so when we do good, it can harden people's heart and we trust God with it. So it's not us desiring to get back at someone, but it's humbling ourselves to trust God with it because he will repay evil for evil, but also... As we're seeking genuine, humble love, I don't think we're des- desire in a vindictive way to do something nice so that they, their heart turns hard and they get crushed by God. I think our posture needs to be humility and just trusting it up to God. Because also in Isaiah 6, a coal can be used to purify. And so we might be heaping coals of judgment by being kind, but I think we also should be very prayerfully asking that God would use those coals to be purifying, that the kindness of God, by in empowering his people to respond kindly in the face of evil, would, would help lead them to repentance, that the kindness of God would lead them to repentance, and we get to play a part in that. And so Paul wraps up all this, this pursuit of genuine love, uh, with a summary, this last line, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So in our reactions, we react as to not be overcome by evil. In our actions, we act to overcome evil by good. And I think it's really important that, that we, we don't think of this evil as individuals. We're not trying to overcome individuals, but we're, trying to, we're, we're fighting a spiritual battle. In Ephesians 6, it says, 6.12, It says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So you see, we have this war and our response as Christians is to pursue genuine love and to overcome evil. And we are overcoming oppressive systems. We are overcoming Satan and his work and his demons. And we are to love individuals. And that is, includes in our church. That includes uh, non-Christians. That includes God's people that are different than us outside the church, in other churches. And so God's people coming together is part of our worship. Our worship of all that God has done for us is is doing our best to love God and to love people passionately uh, by this list of commands. And so uh, I, I'm just going to pray that, that we are able to do so as a church, that we would, we would love God, we would pursue Him and His people passionately. Father, uh, I just pray that, that we would be a church that loves you and loves people genuinely, that we would be intentional, that we would be humble. God, I thank you that um, I'm seeing your spirit work and move in our church, and I pray you would continue to do so. Lord, I, I thank you that we have such a variety of backgrounds and personalities uh, in our church. And, um, and Lord, I pray that, that we would fight for family type relationships and um, not passively 
hate one another or, or be frustrated with one another, but we would, we would all be humble. Lord, this is a season where your church is going to be a light to the world. Uh, because we have hope. We have a real hope that, that comes from you, that comes from uh, the blood-bought love of, of your Son. Lord, that we have been saved, that you are continuing to work, that you will not let um, us as your people fall through the cracks, but you have planned good for us. And so I pray that we would be able to respond humbly, that, that we, your people, would... Um, would know you deeply, would imitate your son deeply, and that we would worship you uh, now and forever. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.